musical chairs with me. Cheer up, Charlie. And today we have the man of many songs, the man of many keys, the man of many notes, Martin Mills! <laughs> Hello, Charlie. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you very much for being here today. Absolute pleasure. Looking forward to it. So, if you're ready, we can just get right into it. Dive straight in, I'm ready. What age did you discover you could really, actually, really well sing? Uh, I was always singing from a very, very young age. And when I was about four or five years old, I used to turn the lounge downstairs in my parents' house into my own theatre. And what I'd do, I'd play videos, as they were in those days, videos of MGM musicals, um, ballets, and uh, Gilbert and Sullivan shows. And I'd have them playing on the television, and I would choose a character to be, and I would act along as that character the whole way through. That's and when cool. that character was off stage or off screen, I would go and sit in the dining room, which was next door. I would walk through the adjoining door like it was the wings, and I would sit there and wait for my next entrance. Uh, so, and then I made my stage debut in an amateur production of South Pacific when I was five years old. Uh, and from then on, yeah, you, you couldn't stop me singing like you, Charlie. I was walking around the house singing and having a great time. Yep. Like, mum can't ever shout me out of the shower because I'm permanently singing and I can't hear her. <laughs> it's a good place to sing in the shower. It's got a fantastic acoustic, so carry yeah, on. It has. <laughs> <laughs> What age did you decide music was going to become your career? I don't know if there was ever a decisive moment in this term, like a eureka moment. I think I just always knew because I was doing these shows uh, after I did that South Pacific, I just carried on. And between the ages of five to 18, I was in about 85 different amateur shows, ranging from pantomimes, the occasional play, but mostly musicals. Everything ranging from Gilbert and Sullivan to uh, modern releases as they were at the time for amateur companies like um, Evita and Ragtime. Um, so no, I just never considered doing anything else. So rather than a, a, a light bulb moment where I thought, no, this is what I'm going to do, I, I, I just always knew. And uh, you know, there was just never any other route that I considered taking. Where did you do your formal training? Ah, well, I never actually had any formal training. My route into the profession was rather unusual. So when I was 18, I was doing my A-levels and I auditioned for about five different drama schools around the UK, some in London, some of them elsewhere. And um, they all said no, they all turned me down. Uh, I'd, uh, I went to one of them where they gave feedback on the day and so there was a group of people for yes, there was a group of people for no, and uh, I was in the group of maybes. And uh, the tutors looked at me and said, oh, Martin, um, we've never actually seen anyone like you before. We're not entirely sure what to do with you. Now, can you come back and audition for us again? And I thought, well, actually, no, um, because I hadn't particularly enjoyed, they were doing these strange, weird exercises where we had to throw ourselves around the room and make strange noises, and I just thought, Actually, I, I don't think, think this is for me. Um, so I decided to take a year out. So I just done my A-level. So instead of going to university or drama school, I decided to take um, a gap year and see what happened. And fortunately, um, it wasn't long after that that I got my first professional show. Uh, so, uh, so although I'd had private singing lessons, I'd never had any formal training as it were. I learnt my profession in the old fashioned way as people used to in rep companies. I learned by actually doing it and getting out there and being in shows and doing the job. Nice. That is cool. Thank you. It's <laughs> very unusual to be able to sing high soprano as a male. When did you discover you could sing that high and do you need to train to keep it as a soprano? Um, okay, so I discovered that I had this voice by accident. It was uh, 2007 and I was working at uh, Kilworth House Theatre in Leicestershire. Uh, which if, you've, if you haven't been there, then you must go. It's a fantastic, fantastic, beautiful out, outdoor theatre. And it was their very first show, and it was the Pirates of Penzance. And it was Tech Week, and as always in Tech Week, there was a lot of waiting around mm -hmm. uh, in this instance, because it was outdoors, because we had to wait for the weather. And uh, just as a laugh, one of the pirates said to the other boys in the show, 
oh, which one of us can sing the Mabel cadenza from Poor Wandering One, which is the uh, leading lady's aria. So um, a couple of boys tried it and he tried it, he couldn't hit the notes. And then um, he tried and couldn't hit the notes and then it was my turn. And, um, tis me! And I just found that these notes were somehow there. Um, and from that moment on, people kept saying, oh, you should do something with this voice. And um, I didn't know what to do. I thought, well, what avenues are there? Um, and it was a year later that I was, uh, I sang Poor Wondering One again um, at a cast party for another show. And this time it was filmed uh, because I had a friend who said, oh, I can't make the party. Can you film it and put it on Facebook? because uh, he wanted to see it. So I put it on Facebook, not thinking anything of it. And a producer uh, then saw uh, the Poor Wondering One video and got in touch and said, um, I've never seen anything like this. This is quite unusual. Um, would you like to do a show? I'll finance a one man show called The Falsetto if you'd like to put it together, which was obviously you know, an offer I couldn't refuse. So that started uh, that sort of route of one man shows, which has developed into what I do now uh, with Ferris and Mills. Uh, but in terms of keeping the voice, um, I wish I had a more scientific explanation to um, give you. Um, I approach singing <laughs> in my falsetto exactly the same way as I do singing in my tenor voice. Uh, I enjoy singing the repertoire from musical theatre, opera, operetta. Uh, and I had a wonderful classical uh, technique given to me by my singing teacher, a great lady called Ellen Mon Wayne. And uh, it's a bit like if you learn classical ballet, you can then adapt safely to dance in different styles. Uh -huh. If you learn to sing classically, you can do exactly the same. You've got the technique to safely sing in different ways. And that's how I've approached my falsetto as well, to sing exactly the same in a solid classical technique. Yeah, um, you're a little bit like me. I have quite a high soprano voice. Oh, what's your highest note? No idea. <laughs> well, we, we should have a sing-off at some point, Charlie. Anything you can sing, I can sing higher. <laughs> I can sing anything higher than you. No, you can't. <laughs> we could go on like this all day, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> you are half of the duo Ferris and Milnes. What on earth possessed you to do West End Live, Broadway and West End Musicals mashup, which is an absolutely brilliant thing by the way if you haven't seen it you don't know what Thank you're missing you. out on that must be <laughs> so difficult to put together it's it's great fun to put, it, it, it can be difficult but it's also great fun now this came about because when i started working with dominic ferris who is um, a fantastic pianist and also sings um we did our first show and uh we wanted to close the first act with a real show-stopping number um, so I suggested um, a mashup medley, and I played him an example from a show called Zip, which I'd seen many years ago, which had an opening number called 16 opening numbers in two minutes. Um, so I, I played it to Dom and thought, well, yeah, we should do something like this. So for our first ever show, uh, we came up with a mashup called 20 Songs in Four Minutes, and that covered everything from opera to Kate Bush to jazz to musical theatre. and. That was the number which went down very well with the audience. So we thought mm -hmm. mashups are the way forward. Uh, so then the same producers as did our very first Ferris and Mills show were producing Stephen Sondheim's 85th birthday mm -hmm. gala at Drury Lane. So we said, would you, you know, you've heard our 20 songs in four minutes, would you like a Sondheim mashup? Uh, that became 33 Sondheim numbers in five minutes. And again, that went well. So when we started doing shows regularly as Ferris and Milnes at the St. James Theatre, which is now the other palace, uh, we thought it would be topical to do a medley celebrating all the musicals in the West End. Uh, and that was 2016. So we had shows like Funny Girl, Gypsy, Billy Elliot had only recently closed, I think. So we had a really strong selection. And from that, we were asked to do the same medley at West End Live that year. And since then it's become a tradition. We update the medley every year. And uh, for 2019, uh, we actually added all the shows on Broadway as well. 
Uh, so we had even more shows to get in because that allowed us to yeah, do things like, uh, things really like Frozen good. so we could put in Let It Go and um, uh, other things as well. So, so yeah, it, it's great fun and we like to have characters speaking to each other from different shows so that, they, so that it, it, it all gels together as one medley. But if you know all the ins and outs of the shows and the characters mm -hmm. that we're uh, doing, hopefully it's a lot of fun and it makes people laugh too. Yeah, yeah. It's just amazing. They Thank are you, Charlie. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> you released your memoir this year, Wildcard. How proud were you seeing this published? Thank you. Um, well, this was a very big moment for me because um, I uh, to write a memoir at all, I think is it, it, it's it's something. Obviously, it's a very very personal thing. But I'm a lot younger than people who normally write um, a memoir. Uh, I'm 33, uh, well I was 32 when I was writing it mostly. Um, but I've been very lucky to be friends with some uh, really inspirational people. These have been uh, stars of old Hollywood, old West End and Broadway, as well as um, war heroes from World War II, um, RAF fighter pilots who flew and fought uh, in the Battle of Britain, on D-Day and uh, at Dunkirk. So I was approached by a publisher, uh, Zulika Books in London, and they asked me if I would write uh, my own personal story telling why these friendships with much older people had been so influential to me as a young person growing up. Um, so it was a very personal story to write because you know, as I'm sure we'll chat about, I did not have the best time when I was at school and I found it very hard to connect with people my own age. Um, but I was able to develop throughout my life these extraordinary friendships with people who truly inspired me and helped turn my life around. So yeah, in answer to your question, when uh, Wild Card came out, um, it was a very big moment for me because I I'd revealed a lot of very personal stuff about myself. So think, oh my goodness, you know, so people like, you know, the man on the street is going to know all this, you know, <laughs> you know, very, you know, um, intimate stuff. Uh, but I, I was very proud of it. And I'm very proud that people seem to have connected with it and enjoyed mm -hmm. it. And also, I hope it's a fitting tribute to um, the wonderful friends who are, some of, the, some of them are still thriving. I've got a, um, uh, a Tony Award uh, winning friend, Elizabeth Seal, who is of a certain age and is still doing the splits. Uh, a great friend of mine, Jean Bayliss, the original Maria in The Sound of Music. Uh, celebrated her birthday just yesterday, uh, the day before we filmed this interview, and she's still thriving and keeping busy. So I hope it's a tribute to uh, those wonderful friends and also those of uh, those stars of Hollywood, Broadway, and the war heroes who are no longer with us. So yes, I, I was very happy and very excited. <laughs> What's your most memorable moment today? You must have so many, but does one really stand out to you? I've got a few, but I think one which will always stay with me is the night that uh, Dominic and I performed uh, at Drury Lane in Sondheim's birthday gala. We didn't realise either of us at the time just what, uh, what that was going to do for us, the doors that it was going to open. Um, and I, rem I have a veteran actress friend named Eileen Page, who is now 94. And uh, she was in the audience that night and she herself had played at Drury Lane uh, many years before. And she'd first been there in 1939. She attended the last matinee performance at Drury Lane before the theatre was shut uh, when World War II started. So there's a lot of history in there. And when Eileen herself had played Drury Lane many years after the war, uh, but also many years uh, before uh, we did the Sondheim Gala, she said to me that she stood on stage center at Drury Lane and she, uh, she was listening to the applause after she'd sung. Um, and she said, if, if I never have anything else in my life, I'll have this moment. And I wanted, and I felt that very much the same myself. I thought if my career ends tonight, I will have had this moment. I will have stood center stage at Drury Lane and had this moment. And I was, I remember being center stage and we were doing the section where Send in the Clowns comes into the medley. 
And I just had this moment where I'm standing center stage at Drury Lane and I'm singing Send in the Clowns. This is pretty cool. Um, so, so yes, although there have been numerous other things which I've loved and which I've been very proud of in terms of uh, um, a defining moments uh, that that evening at Drury Lane will stay with me forever. Yeah. Many people would kill to be able to sing centre stage, send in the clowns at Theatre Royal Drury. Drury, Drury. Oh, I, I can <laughs> recommend it, Charlie. You, if you ever get a chance to do it, then stand yeah. centre stage at Drury Lane and sing send in the clowns. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Were you ever bullied as a child? Well, like I said to you, I did not have the best time growing up. I felt very isolated because and this is why it's wonderful to connect with people like you, Charlie, because we have a lot in common. I knew from a very early age that I had a great passion for musical theatre and uh, film, and I loved to sing. And other kids at my school didn't get that. I can't say I was ever physically bullied. Uh, people did actually try, but I uh, was uh, very good at putting them down, if that makes sense. So I, I would come back at them. In fact, I quoted Shakespeare at one boy who was trying to bully me. And I said, get thee to a nunnery, which is from Hamlet. And he was just so bemused that he didn't know what the heck to make of me or what I said, but he didn't know not to try again. Um, but at the same time, people did say very unkind things. And that, that was very upsetting and uh, quite damaging in some ways. Uh, and that is why in later life, um, when these uh, great old stars who I had idolized and been inspired by when I was very young became my actual friends. That was a very big deal for me. Uh, so you ask, uh, was I ever bullied? Um, not, in uh, not in terms of physically, but yes, there were a lot of people, sadly, who um, knew that I was vulnerable and played to my insecurities. Mm -hmm. And what I had to do was keep strong and uh, I had enough to throw myself into all the shows that I was doing, uh, amateur theatre and so forth. Um, but yes, it, it, it did sting and it did hurt. But when people ask me about it, I just say you just have to hold your nerve and stay in there as you have, Charlie, because sooner or later you will find the people as you have who mm -hmm. truly care about mm -hmm. you and who yeah. you can relate to. Yeah. And when that happens, that's a fantastic thing. So you mustn't ever let those people who are trying to intimidate you, and sometimes they're very jealous as well. I think jealousy mm -hmm. plays a great deal uh, into that. Um, so, so yeah, you've just got to hold on in there. And yeah, I didn't have the best time growing up, but now I'm very happy and very settled. And I'm grateful for the friends that I do have around me of, of all ages. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the arts brings out so much negativity in people? Yet so many people get so much enjoy from it. It's tr uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, again, I think the arts can bring out negativity, possibly going back to jealousy, which I was just uh, saying about before, in terms of people n not being able to have the skills or perhaps being scared to open up and say, I want to sing, I want to dance, I want to do shows and so forth. Um, but also, I think we, we suffer because uh, of, and, and I think television culture has a lot to do with this as well. Everybody assumes that, oh, it's any, anybody can sing, anybody can do that. That's not a real job. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, if you, if mm -hmm. you think that, try it. Um, yep. Try it and, and just see how difficult it is. Uh, so I think a lot of people sneer at it because they don't really see it as a proper job. Because, I mean, I have a friend who's been in, in Les Mis. Um, and um, sort of when, when it came out that he was going into the show, uh, people say, oh, well, you'll, you'll have to let me know when you're on. And just like, well, I'm, I'm on every night. And like, oh, so, but, 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 you know, they, they assumed that even though it was the West End, he was just dropping in to do it as a hobby when he felt like it. But a lot of people don't understand. And I think because those, it, it can be a very difficult profession, but it can also be a very exciting profession. Uh, so I, I think people have uh, um, one of get the most excited. Excited. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we are lucky to, to lead an exciting lifestyle, but we have a great many difficulties that come, come with that. So in terms of um, 
uh, we bring joy to a great many people and we've got to hang on to that. And that's why this <laughs> is, is so important, especially you know, hanging on to it now during this lockdown period. Yeah. Um, but, but no, I, I think it's a combination of people being jealous and people perhaps not understanding it. And a lot of people who don't understand that profession. Yeah. <laughs> I was bullied for my love of dance and song. How do you think we can change the negative behaviour that seems to evolve massively from the playground? Again, a very, very good question. I think we have to make people aware of it as possible. Uh, because I think certainly when I was at school, um, there wasn't as much exposure to the theatre and arts. Um, well, I, I, it may have changed now, but uh, however much there is, we always need more. And I think what people in education need to understand are the benefits of it. I think it's sometimes it's seen as, oh, yes, well, we'll, 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 we'll do something if, if we have time. But no, I think it should be absolutely prioritised. Um, so, but people are scared of what they don't understand. They fear what they don't understand and they can't get their head around it sometimes. So when, like you and I, you know, you're singing in the playground and you want to share this great passion and people don't understand it, um, it's because they've not been exposed to it. And if, if they do um, learn more about it and can see that it's something which they too can enjoy, and maybe it's something that they think they won't enjoy, but then they're exposed to it and they find they do. I find that a lot. Um, that could hopefully make a difference. So the more music, drama, dance, art that we can get into school, the better. And also, as well, I mean, social media can be a very bad place, but can also be a very, very good place. Mm -hmm. so if we can get the right messages sent out to people that way, then there could be a very exciting way forward, I think, anyway. Yeah. Are you involved with any charities? Yes, I am. There is a charity which has been uh, very close to my heart uh, for the last 10 years, and it's the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust. Um, and I got involved with them um, about 2009 and I sang for the um, uh, 70th anniversary celebrations commemorating the Battle of Britain the following year. Now what the charity does, uh, in, similar to what we were just saying about raising awareness about things, it raises educational awareness about the Battle of Britain in 1940 and the veteran fighter pilots who flew it because you know, in a, a, a very, very potted version would be basically um, in 1940, um, um, all of Europe was under the control of Nazi Germany and it was written, we were the only ones left. And all that was between us was the English Channel. There was France, English Channel and Britain. So our RAF fighter pilots kept the Germans out. They stopped the German invasion, which is why the Battle of Britain is a very, very big deal. Um, and it's surprising how many people still don't know the full story behind it, especially younger people. So as well as looking after the veterans, who are literally the people who saved our country, saved our civilization, we, ha we are doing this interview now because these incredible men won the Battle of Britain. Um, so anything that I can do to help spread that story and the educational side of it um, is very, very dear to me. And uh, we also look after uh, the war veterans and uh, uh, there's a great deal of good work which is done by the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust. So that is a charity with which I'm most associated with and uh, with which I'm very proud um, to be a part. Yeah. yeah. Who was your biggest influence growing up? and Are they still your biggest influence today? Uh, yeah, I've, I've had um, quite a few. My parents have been fantastic. They've been really supportive of uh, my career choices and everything that I've wanted to do. Uh, but professionally, um, there have been a number of people. I idolised uh, an actress you may have heard of, uh, an American theatre and film actress named Catherine Hepburn. And I related to her because she was very quirky. Some people may even say eccentric. And she had a career which lasted from the 1930s right through to the 1990s. Uh, and she was a very strong, independent figure. She made her own way and she didn't care what people said about her. So I've always had a great deal of uh, affection for Catherine Hepburn, who continues to be a great inspiration. Uh, but on a more close to home, uh, the actress I mentioned earlier, Jean Bayliss, who was the original Maria in The Sound of Music, the first of my veteran friends of theatre and film. Um, she remains, I say, you know, my greatest inspiration in the theatre because she has backed me the whole way 
and she's a lady who had an incredible career, Richard Rogers himself chose her to be the original Maria in the very first West End production of The Sound of Music at the Palace Theatre, where Harry Potter is now. And uh, her stage presence, you can tell from the recordings and the film footage that there is, is just fantastic. And to see her live when she still occasionally does things, it's a masterclass. She's, uh, so she is certainly a great influence who is still very much uh, with me in my life now. Now for some funny questions. Go this is it. my intro moment now, so you ready? <laughs> okay, shoot. What role would you most like to play regardless of gender, animal or age? Ooh, okay, I'm going to say I've got two parts which I'd love to play. Uh, which I'll never get to normally, Laloon in the musical Kismet, who's a very glamorous character and she has two fantastic numbers, Not Since Nineveh and Rahad Lakoum. And uh, I, I would love to play Laloon, it's such a vampish, fabulous part. And also, I would like to play Lady Chang in The King and I, because I <laughs> think she's, be cool. uh, she, yeah, she's, a, she's a great character, very noble character with great dignity, and you get to sing something wonderful, which I think is one of the most beautiful Rodgers and Hammerstein songs ever written. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go with those two. Yeah. Yeah, we know a lot about The King and I. It's a good one. It's a, fanta a fantastic production at the London Palladium relatively mm. recently. Mm -hmm. What do you most get in trouble for? Oh, <laughs> what do I most get in trouble for? Um, well, when I go to this, it's theatrical based, I'm afraid. It's a very theatrical person. When I go to the theatre, uh, I'm very guilty of being, shall we say, I'm the lyric police. I'm, uh, and this comes from doing Gilbert and Sullivan, I think. You know, if somebody says and instead of but by accident, I'm there and they say and instead of but. And uh, yes, yeah, so the people that I go to the theatre with, like my best friend, is like, calm down, Martin, calm down, calm down. So, so yes, if, if there is uh, something I get into trouble for, I get told off by people I go to the theatre with for being, uh, being the lyric police, let's put it that way. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with being the lyric police and liking the lyrics to be correct. Thank you, Charlie, thank you, because if they're well-written lyrics, if they're Sondheim, Hammerstein, Gilbert lyrics, they're all there for a reason. You understand, fantastic. Yes, Sondheim, Hammerstein, Styles and Drew, anybody. Yes, Literally absolutely, yes. any writer. They could be a new yeah, up-and-coming writer, and the lyrics are still important. They are. If, if the lyricist has chosen those words for a specific reason, and if you yes. change one thing, it could change everything. So, yeah, yes. you've got it, Charlie. You've got it. We could go to the theatre together. Let's be the lyric piece, you and uh, police, you and me. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I won't tell you off. Brilliant. Fantastic. No, no, we'll, we'll just have everybody else nudging us. Like, <laughs> <laughs> have you ever tripped over a, a, a prestigious event and got caught? Um... Uh, well, fortunately, I've, I've never um, sort of uh, fallen over myself and gone rolling down the red aisle. Uh, that, you know, that there have always been a few moments on stage. Uh, this, this, it wasn't me, but it was a girl that I was uh, with on stage and she was in this huge ball gown. And unfortunately, she did trip up and uh, could not get up again. So there was this moment where I nearly went flying because uh, she was in this huge, I can picture it now, this huge purple feathered gown and we were doing the masquerade number from Phantom. We weren't in Phantom, but it was a show in which masquerade was appearing. So we tried to go, masquerade! And, you know, try, trying to pick her up with as much dignity as you can, which is a bit difficult because she kept slipping on a dress and going back down like that. So uh, <laughs> it wasn't my misfortune, but it was hers in terms of tripping up. So Just make it look story. like it was meant to be part of the show. We tried, we tried our best. You know, so, so, so it, it, there was myself and another chap and in the end we couldn't get her up so we just presented her like that and sort of as she's meant to be down there. So we covered it up as best we could. Yeah. What is your most disgusting habit? This is my favourite question to ask because we all have one. Even you. <laughs> oh, now we're getting up close and personal. Oh, oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm not sure what I can... Uh, well, I, I, maybe I've left the loo seat up a few times. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, I'm sure there's something far more disgusting than that, but I don't know if I can share it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> now for a round of quickfire questions. Love a quickfire question. Go. Text or talk? Talk. It's Favourite good to city? Talk. London. Chocolate or Haribo? <gasps> Haribo. Favourite place to eat? Um, Joe Allen's restaurant. 
<laughs> sandals with or without socks? Oh, you can't wear sandals, you know, with socks. You've got to wear them <laughs> without. Pizza or burger? Burger. Favourite song? I'm still here from Follies. Cool. Best childhood book? Oh, um, <laughs> well, I didn't read child uh, books exactly. I was always reading books by, um, uh, by, by film stars. So, oh, quick, what, what did I enjoy reading? Esther Williams, Million Dollar Mermaid. I was a child when I read that. And it's a great book by a great MGM star. So Esther Williams, Million Dollar Mermaid, childhood book. Love it. Cool. Favourite superhero? Batman. First celebrity crush? <laughs> a lady called Dolores Gray, who I was very young at the time. She played La Lume in Kismet, which I think is why I want to play La Lume in Kismet today. So yes, d you weren't expecting this answer, but Dolores Gray. Hogwarts House. Oh, I think I'd have to be a Gryffindor. If I'm not a Gryffindor, I'm Hufflepuff, but I want to be a Gryffindor. <laughs> Favourite Harry Potter character? Professor McGonagall. I think she's great. Now it's for a tongue twister. Oh my goodness. <laughs> can you can? Can you can? A can as a canner. A can as a canner. Can can a can. Can can a can. I know you can say you it. can a can a can can can. <laughs> oh, my oh I think she certainly can can can. That's another number. Um <laughs> Can you can a can, a can and a can? They go, oh, I, I, I'm defeated, Charlie. You've got me. I've got, me. I've got yes. one for you. I've got one for you. Say this very quickly. Ken, Dodds, Dad's, Dogs, Dead. Ken, Dogs, Dad's, Dogs, Dead. Yeah, Ken, Dodds, Dad's, Dogs, Dead. Ken, Dodds, dad, Dad's, Dogs, Dead. <laughs> yes, we've both defeated each other, Charlie. And then you say that as a vocal warm-up very fast. Ken Dodds, Dad's Dog's Dead. Ken Dodds, Dad's Dog's Dead. Ken Dodds, Dad's Dog's Dead. Good tongue twister. And now there is something for my enjoyment and really just my enjoyment only. Do you think you could do me okay. a song mashup of just three songs? A song mashup of just three songs? Okay, right. Okay, now we can, we can do this. Um, um, okay, so a um, bit of Noel Coward and okay. two GMS songs. Okay, so. No matter what price is paid, what stars may fade above, I'll follow my secret heart to life I love <laughs> Song three. Never to part, never to. two GNSs in there for you. So that was awesome. an, an improvised three song mashup. Nice. <laughs> thank you so much, Martin. That was an absolutely amazing interview. And thank you well, for thank singing you. just out of the blue. No warm up, no nothing. Oh, uh, it's a way forward, Charlie. I'll always take people by surprise. That's what I say. So thank you very much for um, asking me along today and uh, for such great questions as well. You're a fantastic interviewer. Thank you. It was a pleasure pleasure talking to you. And Bye. to you too. Bye. Bye.